This message CD is produced by Tamil Christians Global Network. Visit our website www.tamilchristian.com. This is not my first visit to London. Many years ago, when I was a student in the seminary, I sang in the a cappella choir, and we traveled. One year we came to Canada, and at that time, the family with whom I stayed decided I should be oriented to Canada properly, and that meant an ice hockey game. Kitchener and London are traditional rivals, so I was told then in ice hockey. So I watched a very thrilling game when the puck flies everywhere and the people can get quite excited about the game. So this is not my very first visit to London, Ontario, but I'm grateful to be here. My wife is uh, here also somewhere. Oh, there she is. And I wanted you to know, um, she not only goes with me, but she is very much an energizer in whatever I do. So I'm thankful to God for that. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a full taste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Prince introduced me and reminded me about my school days. The last hymn that we sang, Holy, 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 
Lord God Almighty, written by Bishop Heber. When I visited this city where I went to school, they, the last time they asked me to preach at St. John's Church, and where I sat down close to the altar, there was the grave of Bishop Reginald Heber as a young man. The Anglican bishop went swimming in Trichy, Trichinopoly, and was drowned. He wrote many hymns. The one that is most famous and well known is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And um, the school that I attended was named after him, the Bishop Weaver High School. And the one that uh, Prince referred to as being his grandfather was the mathematics teacher. His name was Victor. And um, Everybody, including my mother, decided that I was incorrigibly excluded from the gift of mathematics. And um, so she complained to this teacher of mine and said, my son is no good, etc. He corrected her and said, that is not true. Send him to me. So she gave me the word that I was asked to see my teacher, which in itself was threatening. And then she added to that saying, go, he'll straighten you out. So with fear and trembling, I went to Mr. Victor's house. I had a piece of a pad and a pencil, and I didn't know what else was awaiting me. He invited me in, made me sit down, I went in and got on Murgal Tose. I don't, some of you don't know what Tose is. It's a pancake. Only uh, rice is the medium and it's paper thin normally. If you know how to do it, that's the best way to do it. And when it's paper thin, it'll be crisp. Now, I didn't expect all of this. I thought he was going to really blast into me. The man made me comfortable, gave me breakfast, gave me time to finish it. And then he came and started teaching me the first theorem. I never forgot. Not only did I not forget, I scored a hundred out of a hundred in mathematics. There is something about a mentor who believes in you. Jesus Christ believes in you. We use the term, he's my savior and my master. We lose part of the glow because he believes in you. Simon came to him because Andrew brought him. And Jesus told him, your name is Simon, but I'll make you Petros, the rock. Simon probably thought this man doesn't know. Nobody can make me a rock. I'm the most vacillating, unpredictable man. And yet, before Jesus was through, Simon became Peter, the Petros, the rock. He's investing in you, and he believes in you. From what um, um, Prince told me, there's plenty of time. There is no dearth for time this morning. I would like to share fundamental things 
and then maybe go to the mission to which God has called you and me. The reason we have come here this morning on a holiday, which is a rare thing, and um, this is a three-day weekend, am I not right? Yeah. Normally, sane, calculating Canadians don't come to church on Monday morning on a three-day break. They are out somewhere doing what Canadians do. This is true in south of the border, too. But you have come because you know he has invested in you. And you want to now look at the scripture to know what he expects of you. Am I right? If you decided not to talk on Mondays, I need to break open a news to you. You can talk on Monday also. Just try it. And if you think that this is a time you must become suddenly non-communicative, I don't believe in that. I believe good Protestant communication is a two-way process. Don't you? Thank you. Now you're catching on. Jesus preached in streets, not in st sedate, starchy environment we like to think it should be. If this is starchy, then the rest of life must be starchy, is it? When you drive in the freeway, can you be starchy and survive? Just loosen up. Talk to me. In the Tamil of Vesna Peswingla, that's good. You're at least laughing. No, I, I'm, I'm not thinking that it's a one-way communication. I want to hear from you. Yes or no. At least a nodding acquaintance. If you don't nod, at least wink at me. Don't sit there and stare at me. Jesus called people. There are four fundamental things for missions. Let me enumerate them. First, you don't have an identity until you know he has called you. You don't have an identity until you know he has called you. Isn't calling for special people? No. The basic calling is for anybody who wants to be a Christian. In Paul's writings, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Consider your calling, brethren. Not many of you are great. <coughs> this is in verse 26. Did you bring your Bible? All right. One, two. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank you. Good, good. If you forgot to bring, thank you. If you forgot to bring, somebody foolishly would have brought it. Smile at them. Don't look at them as you're looking at me. They won't share a thing with you. If you smile, they may share. Don't sit like this, Baba. Open your hands. Open the Bible. See what the Word of God contains. All right. Paul says to the Corinthian church, Consider your calling, brethren, not many of you are wise according to the flesh. Not many are mighty. Not many are noble. But you are called. Paul believes that every Christian who is a member of the body of Jesus Christ is a called person. You may be in the information technology, but your primary calling is to be a Christian. Are you listening? Right. You yeah, don't have to shout. Just say yes. I can hear you very well. Just a soft yes will do. Yes. Your primary calling is to be a Christian. And whatever else we do, we do in order to pay expenses. That doesn't mean we minimize the importance, but 
in everything you set out to do, you do as unto the Lord, because he has called you. Peter says the same thing. Turn with me to the first epistle of Peter. <clears throat> and the second chapter, 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who, what? What's the next word? Called you. Called you. But Peter and Paul believed that you are not an average Christian, you are a called person. Nobody, I mean nobody who is a member in the body of Jesus Christ is not called. He taps you on the shoulder. What is this calling? What does it contain? Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, please. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1. From verse 14 onwards, here is the description of the calling of the first four disciples. <clears throat> Simon, Andrea, Jacob, Johan. The four first disciples were called in this passage. Mark narrates this incident by saying that after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. The only message Jesus preached as gospel is the message of the kingdom of God. You should know this. Calling involves the kingdom. Calling involves the collective responsibility that relationships bring to us. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, saying four things. Time is fulfilled. I'm in the 15th verse of the first chapter of Mark. He said four things here. First, time is now, not yesterday, nor tomorrow. Yesterday and tomorrow are impinging on what you do now. Time is now. It's fulfilled for you. The kingdom of God is here. It is nothing that is remote. It is pressing in on you like your next breath. The kingdom of God is here. What do I do then? If you want to enter in, repent, turn around. It's not a concession you do to God. It is God's invitation to you. What kind of turning around is this? It's a 180 degree reversal. Repent. Because the values you are celebrating now don't belong to the kingdom of God. Repent. And believe. Believe the offer that God is making. In order to accept that offer, turn around. You are going in the wrong direction. We came from Toronto. If we had to arrive in London, we should go in the right direction, right or wrong. Simple, very simple, elementary, Mr. Watson. And if you miss this, you miss the whole thing in the Bible. Without repentance, there is no new beginning. Believe in the gospel. And then, he didn't leave it to chance. He called his people specifically. He was not saying, take it or leave it. He was saying, I'm meaning you. Come on, let's go. Simon, Andrea, Jacob, Johan, four people. What is this calling? 17th verse has got the content of this calling. Then Jesus said to me, said to them, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. I think in this passage there are five things that explain the calling. First, the context of the call is the kingdom of God. Please don't think because you are smart, God calls you. Are you listening? Especially smart people. I, I 
beg of you, please listen. It's not your smartness or my smartness that impresses God. What is the focal point is God made you and me to be part of his rule. Without that rule, we are not human yet. So especially for smart people, if you want to be a human being, you need to hear him call you. The context of the call is the rule of God, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has three aspects to it in the teaching of Jesus. First, it is the rule of the other, not my rule. The call involves a willingness to know that there is another who rules. And my recognition is the only reason I've been giving, given a will of my own is to will his will, not to fight his will. You seem as if you're listening, are you? This is foundational and it's the most shattering reality. Knowing the call is not Continuing as I did before, not at all. Knowing the call fundamentally means the reason I have a will is not to conflict with his will, but to affirm his will. The kingdom of God is the rule of God, the rule of the other. The second thing, it is the realm within which such a rule is accepted. The sun, the moon, and the stars and the celestial bodies, including all the millions of stars and the clusters that are being discovered, all of them obey his rule. Predictably, they obey his rule. But until I acknowledge that rule in me, that rule does not affirm itself in me. I can exclude myself. Saul, Saul, it's difficult for you to kick against the prick. Do you recall that? If you stare at me, I know nothing. I want to know whether you know or not so that I, I need to explain or just keep passing on. Do you know what I'm talking about? Who is this Saul I'm talking about? Could you be a little bit more clear? Who is this Saul? Paul, yeah. The man who became Paul afterwards on the road to Damascus. Why did he say it's hard for you to kick against the prick when all the universe is moving according to his... If you fight this, you're spitting into the wind. You're the loser. Saul, when are you going to realize that? Especially smart people. Do you know this? Your smartness is not to intend it, to fight God. Your smartness is to acknowledge that God is. It's the realm within which such a rule is accepted. Will it involve me as the realm? A question that you need to settle. The third thing about the rule of God, it's the result of such a rule in such a realm. Age makes no difference. Calendar years is not a threat because if you are obeying him, the maturity of the increasing knowledge of the context and the content of such an obedience makes you productive. There is no restriction. There is no retirement age for being a disciple. The, the rule, the realm, and the result, by their fruit you shall know them.
the context of your call and my call is the kingdom. So obedience is the rule of the game. The second thing is, the call itself is very simple. You, me, let's go. To Simon, to Andrea, to Jacob, and to Johan, the call that day was, you, me, let's go. What about my wife? Don't worry, I'll take care of her. Your wife is more my concern than your concern. What about my husband? Don't worry, I died for him. I care more for him than you can ever. You follow me. Personal, intimate, direct. You, me, let's go. The context is the kingdom. The call is simple and direct. The third thing, there is a promise included in this. What is that promise? I will make you. My excuse immediately is I don't have the wherewithal to follow you. I'm not a good person. Simon said this. Get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Jesus said, I didn't come here to stir up in you the consciousness of being a sinner and go away. I came to remake you, Simon. Do not be afraid. Follow me. <coughs> First, the context. Second, the call. The third is the commitment. I will make you. I will make you. Who is the one who is telling me this? He's the one who made me. If he created me, he is the only one who can recreate me. If I messed up the intentions that he had at the time of creation, he is the only one who can recreate me. And he accepts that responsibility. Follow me. I will make you. Context, call, commitment. The fourth, way, the fourth thing is consequence. What will happen if I followed you? What will be the results? Not only will you be remade, but there will be palpable, measurable, empirically definable fruit results. You shall be fishers of men. Not only will your personal history be affected, but the history of all relationships you bear with others will be affected. It is personal, measurable, measurable, measurable result. There's a fifth element, though, and that is the choice that the called person makes. The context, the call, the commitment, the consequence, and then the choice. I need to choose to say yes to the call. Am I right or wrong? Are you listening? Yes. What happened to these four? Simon and Andrew left their boats and nets and walked. John and James, not only the nets, but their father and the hired servants. John and James obviously had more than Peter and Andrew did. They could hire servants. All these nicer things, they left and followed him. It's a choice that you and I make. It can be in India, Sri Lanka, or London, Ontario. Unless you make that choice, nothing happens. <clears throat> Both in Sri Lanka and in India, buffaloes are fairly well-known animals, aren't they? You didn't know a buffalo at all? Ermomade. 
That's a fine description. When it rains or when fo water falls on the back of a buffalo, the animal doesn't bother at all. It's known as water buffalo, am I not right? Are you listening to me? It just keeps going slowly. And that's the same effect it will have on you. If you don't make a choice and say, he's speaking to me. Without this call, you have no identity. I'm sorry. You may be known as a Methodist or a Baptist. I'm a Methodist pastor. Being called a Methodist makes very little difference. Please forgive me. But knowing that he called you makes all the difference. Poland. I was preaching in, in an area in the country which is predominantly Lutheran. Young people came by the thousands. And the government, which was a Marxist government, ran special trains to bring them. It must be the hand of God, but they came. And the preaching was done in a tent, a circus tent. Thousands responded to their Lord. I kept calling them to Jesus. So the pastors came to me one night and asked me, why do you call them to Jesus and not to the Lutheran church? I said, if I call them to the Lutheran church, you'll have problems in your hands. But if they come to Jesus, they'll make very good Lutherans. No, it's not a laughing matter. It's a very important difference. The calling is not to be Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal. The calling is to follow Jesus. And then you're a good Pentecostal. Otherwise, you're a cantankerous Pentecostal. You're a problem and a pain. First, the call. It's a call that confers your identity. Second, it is compassion that compels your engagement with the world. It is compassion that compels your engagement with the world. Look at Mark chapter 1 again. The last paragraph, beginning with verse 40, all the way down to verse 45. Story of a leper. Do you know this story? Two people <coughs> with fear and trembling say yes. What about the rest of you? Do you or don't you? Hey, if you're going to sit like this, indifferently, I'll fold my arms and go and sit back there. You think I won't do it? I will. I don't mind. I have no reputation to lose. Only if I have a reputation, then I need to worry about a reputation. I have no reputation. So I don't worry. Liven up, will you please? You have your Bible, get engaged, and don't be indifferent because it's you who is the loser. Do you know this story? Do you know this story? Did I shout like that? Do you know this story? Yes. What's the story? You know it, but you won't tell it. Jesus touches him first. Mark says, moved with compassion, he touched him. Before he said the word, be clean, he did something that is amazing. He touched the leper. In the days of Jesus, if you touched the leper who was known to be unclean, you lost your holiness. Your spirituality was gone. And it was a very, very threatening thing to do 
when you touch a leper, publicly particularly. And he touched him, and then he said, be clean. And Mark says that's because he had compassion. The first quality of compassion is, you can't do compassion from a distance. Compassion compels engagement. Compassion is visceral before it is cerebral. We sit in committees and discuss about doing compassion. But primarily, compassion is visceral. It is first the compulsion and then the cerebral activity as to how this can be sustained. Mission, engagement with the society, is the visceral compulsion. When a little boy comes running who is learning how to walk, every child, while it's learning to walk, falls many times. And if it gets discouraged, the child will never walk. It happens everywhere, including London, Ontario. <coughs> what does a mother say when she looks at the child repeatedly falling? The mother says, when you fall, my womb turns inside of me. This is Tamil. In Kulai Nadungudu. What does that mean? There's something happening inside of me which is not a cerebral activity. Instinctively, my child, I want to jump to do something for you. Compassion is that motivation. Moved with compassion, the Lord of the universe first touched him and then said, be clean. He could have said, be clean without touching. He wanted to tell his disciples, if compassion is going to motivate you, you can't sit in an ivory tower and do missions. You need to be right where people are and in contact with them fulfill the compulsion of compassion. Called people or compassionate people. Compassion compels engagement. Compassion is visceral before it is cerebral. There's one more thing about compassion in this passage. He said, don't do any publicity out of this. He told the leper, go show yourself to the priest. Get into circulation. Become a respected member of your society. They have excluded you. I'm putting you back into the stream of the society. But don't make any publicity. Don't talk to anyone else, only to the priest. Why? Because compassion is never done for publicity. Mission in the name of Jesus is not for personal publicity or notification or notoriety. Missions in the name of Jesus is a response to compassion which doesn't ask for any personal attention. And yet, the man went and talked a great deal, and Jesus couldn't enter the towns anymore because the crowd was enormous and very disturbing. But Compassion is what compels you and me into engagement with the society. Missions is because you feel the heart of God. A man who was the founder of World Vision, with whom I've been associated for a long time, Bob Pierce used to say, let my heart be moved with the things that move the heart of God. If God's heart is compassionate, and this is an Old Testament story, the Old Testament prophets spoke about God as a compassionate God. If God's heart is compassionate, and this God has called me, then I need to learn compassion. It's compassion that compels engagement. There's a third thing that is fundamental, and that is 
the commission sets my values. There's a commission, the, the most well-known commission of Jesus is in Matthew, Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. After resurrection, Jesus comes and stands among his disciples. The eleven were there, and Jesus spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. I am the Lord of life and death, of heaven and earth, all the Hegelian opposites, whatever is the thesis and the antithesis, I am the Lord. This is the kingdom. There are no polarities within the kingdom of God. And so he says, because of this authority, I'm telling you, it's not to anybody and everybody. It's for those who made the choice to live under his authority. To him, he says, I'm telling you, go. If you are a called person and your primary vocation is to be a disciple, this commission includes you. It includes me. Because you bow and recognize my authority, says Jesus, I'm sending you. There is no responsibility with corresponding, without corresponding authority. Am I right? It's one of the basic principles of management. If you ask me to do something, give me the authority to do it. Otherwise, don't. He says, I give you the authority. Now go do it. What does he want me to do? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. I am teaching you. Now you go and teach them. As you learn, you become the one who is responsible for the learner. There was a great Bible teacher in Hyderabad. I don't know if there's anyone here from Hyderabad. Is that good? Good. Amazing. I don't know if you know one Dr. Masilamani. If you don't know, that's okay. I am. But he was a great man. He was a Bible society man, a great teacher of the Bible. Dr. Masilamani used to say, the Satguru, who is the Satguru? Who's a guru first? Huh? Teacher. Right. You responded so quickly. Then you quietened down. Don't worry, you're right. That's why I asked you. Who's a guru? I'm intimidating you, isn't it? That's why you don't speak. Maybe without this microphone, you will not feel intimidated. Who is a guru? A guru is one who opens your eyes to things that you did not know existed. He opens the eyes of your heart. Right. Manakangar. Because you, you see things that you have never seen before. Who is the Satguru? If the very God above is the guru who is doing this to you, that is Satguru Baba. Yesu Christu is the Satguru. What is he revealing to you? The things you will never know otherwise. Distinctions and differences with, between real values and the mirage and the myth. It's he who is revealing it to you. As the Satguru teaches you, and as you obey him, teach them. Missions is a totally different value system that you accept and live by. Hence, you teach others. It's not one culture imposing itself on another culture. Are you listening? Because all cultures are in trouble. 
Nobody has the right to say, I'm better than you, let me teach you how. We thought so at one time. Then we began to realize how messed up all of us are. There's only one culture that is the dominant culture, that's the culture of the kingdom of God. And if you belong to the culture of the kingdom of God, there are new sets of values. And if you live those values, no way you have opted to live them, you can teach them and make them disciples. This was marvelously the teaching of the Great Commission. What are the values that I should know, the kingdom values? That I, I keep for myself five values that I'd like to check my life constantly against. May I give it to you very quickly? What is not a value first, and then what is the value? When I say no to this, what is it that I will say yes to? Do I make sense? If I could categorize like that, prestige is a non-value for kingdom people. Prestige is a non-value for kingdom people. Why? Because the king himself was a servant. When the king is the servant, how, how can I live on prestige? So prestige is a non-value. I need to live that way. What will I fill in that place? Servanthood is what I will fill in that place. I am meant to be a mentor of anybody and everybody who would come my way, whom I can meet, who will trust at home, in the place of work, in the casual contacts, in the society, in the church. My number one value is to be a servant, a mentor who will build others. The second value, manipulatory power is not power. That is not kingdom people's power. Manipulation is what your organizational chart tells you. Do you have an organizational chart for your organization? Do you or don't you? You do, don't you? Yeah. The guy on top, the guy below. Let me not go any further than that. The guy on top tells you, do me as I ask you to do, you'll get perks. If you don't do, I'll cut your tail. Right or wrong. They say it in flowery language. But the ultimate result is, either you stay or you leave, depending on how much you will let me manipulate you. Over against that concept of power, that doesn't belong to the kingdom. God doesn't manipulate in the kingdom of God. If God is a manipulator, there will be no cross. Why should God go to the cross to redeem you and me, puny creatures? He didn't manipulate you. He gave himself for you. Manipulation is not the style of power. What is the power in the kingdom of God? The cross is power. The cross is a restatement of what is power. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of what the power of the cross would mean. Jesus said, I have power to lay down my life and to pick it up again. Do you know where that reference is? I don't know all the references. Don't think that I know everything. This I rehearsed. That's why I know where this is. Do you understand? If I didn't come prepared, I wouldn't know either. So I'm not threatening you. I'm just inviting you so that you would also search with me. It's found in the 10th chapter of John. When you find it, will you read it? John chapter 10, verse 18. No one takes it from me, but 
That's right. I and only I have the power to lay my life down. And if I lay it down in the name of the king, I have the power to pick it up again. How do I know that this is true? Because Jesus rose up from the dead. Who's the one who first proved this? Stephen was his name. Do you remember the first martyr? You've gone back to the staring game again. Do you remember or don't you remember? Yes. Mudalavdi Rathasakchi. Aum Perana Stevan. What did he do? He said, I see heavens opened up. And I see the Son of God standing at the right hand. I have power to lay my life down. You are not picking it. It's not you. I have laid it. And I will pick it up because it's in his hands. This is total transformation of the concept of power. This is the fiber out of which Christian missions is built. Throughout the centuries, the countless who had the authority to lay their lives down impacted the society. It is not the politicized relationships that change values in society, it is the personal relationship of a person who would say, for this value to change, I put my life down. Example, Ambala. One time in India, now it's in Pakistan. He was a teacher, school teacher from Ireland. Every day, when he went from his house to the school to teach, he saw lepers along the way, and he'll put money and keep walking. God kept disturbing him. One day he said to God, what more can I do? This is the best I can do. He said, no, you don't understand. You can do more. Finally he realized, God was saying, give yourself. So this man gave himself, and the result is, Leprosy mission was born. Stupid question, are you listening to me? The cross is power. Social values do not change by politicized relationships. You and I know, we are part of democracy, aren't we? Uh, you vote politicians in, do they ever fulfill everything they say? Tell me. Isn't that a joke? And the next year comes again and there's a platform and we are all very hopeful this platform is wonderful. And yet, although the platform is wonderful, politicized relationships never change values. It's the personal, committed relationship that says, for you, to have a difference in your life, I put my life down. I can lay it down and I will pick it up again. Let me give you one more example of the transformation of the concept of power through the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Did he or did he not? Thank you. At least now you're nodding. Prior to that, you played the staring game. You almost told me, what is that to you, whether I know or not? It is a great deal to me. If you don't know, it's my task to explain it to you till you know. Do you understand why I ask you? Do you know? He said that from the cross, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Come on. Correct. You say, why do you ask? Because I don't want you to go to sleep. 
That's why I ask. Irritating, yes, that's one way to keep you awake. Honestly, you didn't come here to sleep. We didn't drive all the way from Toronto to put you to sleep, Baba. Somebody else can do that. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. In 1990, I was in Moscow for a pastor's conference. We expected a thousand pastors. Thousand three hundred pastors came. I don't know a word in Russian except Slava Boga, which means praise God. But I circulated among them, and even when you don't know the language, you can understand quite a lot from people who want to be human to you. They told me and made me understand that Mr. Stalin eliminated 21 million people. Amazing. Can one man do that? If you had the power of Mr. Stalin, probably you could. Why did he do this? He had a hope for the future. He had a hope for the future. What was that hope? That he will help emerge a society with no class stratification. All of us here would want that. We want the injustice of a stratified society with caste in it to be blown to pieces so that humanity will be celebrated for no other reason than being human. All of us would like that. Mr. Salin wanted that. And so, in order to make sure that it hope, his hope comes true, he eliminated opposition. Anybody who dissented, Mr. Stalin methodically eradicated. That is irresponsible hope. Are you listening? From the cross, the Son of God, he also had a hope. He hoped for emergence of a society that will be the kingdom of God, where God's will will be done at all times. This falseness of feeling superior to another person because of the position of birth will be the first thing that will go into smithereens because Paul said, there is no more difference anymore. You're all born because of the blood of the Lamb. He had hope to help emerge the society which will be the kingdom of God. And there was dissent, there was opposition. They pinned him to the tree and challenged and said, if you are what you claim you are, come on down. Then we will believe. What did he do? He didn't say, Father, blow them to smithereens. We wouldn't have this church this morning. Did you know that? If he had prayed that prayer, if he had prayed, Father, do justice, there will be no need to preach the gospel because there will be no gospel. But instead he said, Father, forgive them. Why did he say that? Because he felt the responsibility toward the dissent also. What is power? Power is that which feels accountability for those who smear you, who plot your destruction who pin you to the tree. Rejection is not an easy thing to bear. We can call ourselves disciples, but at the point of being rejected for being a disciple, that's the most painful point to survive or not to survive. Stupid question. Are you still listening? Did you use a remote control and turn me off? This is power, not manipulation. Power is personal engagement. That is mission. Power is a grain of wheat falling down and dying so that it will bring forth. The third thing in the value of the kingdom of God, for me, possessions per se is not a value. Possessing your possessions is the value. That we have three cars parked around our house and we always have a parking problem 
is not an indication that we are very rich. Zacchaeus was very rich. But his possessions possessed him until the day Jesus possessed him. And then he possessed his possessions. He could do with them what he was meant to do with them. Half my goods I give to feed the poor. The other half I won't keep to myself. I'll do restitution with it. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this family. Big difference. I know you're, you, you're, you're beginning to see the difference. I hope you do. I'm not assuming you did not know it, but I'm underscoring what you probably already knew. Possessing your possession is the value of the kingdom of God. How do I know that I possess my possession? What I cannot give away possesses me. Today, in a little while, I think um, um, Prabhu will be talking to you about Friends Missionary Prayer Band. There are needs in India. There are needs right now in Pakistan. There are needs in Sri Lanka. If you possess, let me not use it that term, since you possess your possessions, you would say yes. And I will, I'll put my shoulder behind this. Possessions per se is not a value for kingdom people. Possessing your possessions, that is the value. The Bible is not negative about possessions. But the Bible is very careful in warning that the love and the greed for money is the beginning of all evil. Okay, the fourth value that I would like to think that I honor is parochialism is not a value for kingdom people. What is parochialism? <clears throat> parochialism is groupism. There are a million ways in which you can be parochial, million ways. Um, in Seoul, Korea, Bus drivers formed a union. It's nothing in Seoul, Korea alone. Mizoram in India, there was a lorry drivers association that Jesus invaded and completely turned the situation around. But the parochialism can be from professional categories to caste and racism. Kingdom people are not parochial. They don't hold one group against the other group. You may be a member of the union, but if you are a member of the kingdom of God, you, you don't act as if everything in the world is the union. What would replace this groupism, this tendency that makes me think small, it is solidarity with the marginalized, the people who have been left out, for whom nobody cares. In, his, in the Gospels, Jesus made the Samaritan the hero of his story. The Samaritan was the despised man in the society. And Luke picks it up very strongly because Luke was a Gentile. Amazing. So, Solidarity with the marginalized is the value for the kingdom people. And there are marginalized everywhere. There are marginalized in Toronto too. You could be a person who has been marginalized. And may God give you the power of the Holy Spirit that will enable you to do to others what they have failed to do to you. Okay, the last value, the fifth one is... It is not just the, the flesh, the bodily appetites, but it is the fruit of the Spirit. The value of the kingdom people is not just the appetite of the body, the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, 
Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19 onwards. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. It's a long list. And Paul closes this list with an etc. He doesn't close it. He says, if you are habitually doing these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, to live as if my body is the most important thing, is not the value for kingdom people. What is the value? In verse 21, Paul says, no, 22, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Over against that, if this is one set of values, let me give you the other value. And then Paul says, it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. There are nine tastes to this one fruit. Am I right? Yes. It's one fruit. It's in singular. But it's got nine tastes. What does that mean? That means this is the personality of Jesus. No one fruit has nine tastes anywhere. Neither in India, nor in Sri Lanka, not even in Brazil. Second thing I want you to notice is, no tree eats its own fruit. Banana trees don't eat bananas, do they? Try feeding them. Jackfruit, the huge thing in Kerala. You can't feed jackfruit tree with jackfruit. The tree bears the fruit for others. If you have the personality of Jesus blooming in you, it's not for you to say, what a beautiful guy I am. I'm so long-suffering, so loving, so patient. There is not another guy like me. You are sick. Spirit-filled people don't talk about themselves. The fruit they bear is for the people in the family. If you are a fruit-bearing Christian, your wife should look robust. How's that? Turn around, look at her. If you are a fruit-bearing believer, your husband should look sumptuous. This doesn't mean his carnality is being fulfilled. It means that the beauty of Jesus is filling the horizon. May God bless us. That is the value for kingdom people. Those are the five things. You just take it home. Talk it over. Sit down and talk with your spouse. See how much of this will make sense to you. I could give you scripture for all of them. But I need to move on. I've said three things. Your identity depends on the call. It is compassion that compels engagement. It is the commission that gives you the values to live for. And the fourth thing, it is the comforter who gives you the energy. There is no witnessing without the Holy Spirit. There is no mission without the Holy Spirit. The sustainability for the energy, for transforming mission, is the blessed Holy Spirit. I use two words, witness, mission, or evangelism. <clears throat> witness is evangelism without the hook in it. Have you ever done fishing? Yeah, good, thank you. I was, my next question was going to be, do you eat fish? Yes, all of us love fish, but we have never tried fishing. If you go fishing, you have to have a hook and a bait. Sometimes the bait is artificial, but the hook is necessary because you can't pull the fish in without a hook. Witnessing is evangelism. Evangelism is pulling for people.
people for commitment. Witnessing is evangelism without the hook. It is that atmosphere within which evangelism can really take place. In your workplace, you are a witness. Jesus said, you cannot be a witness without the blessed Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He enables you to speak the truth about the motivation that is in you. It's Yesu. It started when I met him. That is the truth. When you speak the truth, it is the Holy Spirit that tells the listener what this man says is true. He witnesses alongside of you to confirm the truth in your witness. Otherwise, your witness will be washed out. In some cases, the witnessing word you say grips the other. I, I know you have known this. And transformation takes place. In other occasions, nothing seems to stay. But if the Holy Spirit is with you, it will not be wasted at all. A year, a month, several years afterwards, they will still remember that. I've known this happen many times. But the blessed Holy Spirit is the indispensable person for mission. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no mission. He energizes you and me. He gives us the gifts for mission. All the gifts mentioned in the New Testament are relevant now. He also bears the personality of Jesus in us. Gifts may be different, but the fruit of the Spirit is the same. It confirms who we are because we bear the same fruit. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no mission. Now, I think that the time restraint is 12.30. Am I right? Am I right, Prince? That wall clock is right, I, I take it. Yeah, if it's not right, it ought to be right. Because I'm going by that wall clock. All right. There's probably 35 minutes more before we close. I need to go to the most crucial part of mission. Jesus said, if you would open your Bible, please. Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 27, Really, the passage should be from verse 23, but the key verse is 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plunder the house. What is the context? When Jesus cast out demons, the people who were opposing him, particularly Pharisees, said that he was doing it by the power of the demon itself. Jesus ridiculed them. On, an, on another occasion, he would say, if the devil is fighting against the devil, then his kingdom is over. But he would say, unless you know how to bind the devil, you cannot release the people who are under his hold. If mission ultimately is the effort to release people from bondage to the wrong kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the demonic, then we should know how to bind the demonic to have effectiveness in mission. How do I live with that kind of an authority? Let me take you to scripture and be as close as I can to what the scripture says. Would somebody read Revelation chapter 12, Verse 11, please. And they overcame him and the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the Lamb. They did not love their life. Right. Who are the they? They are those who have crossed Jordan. They are those 
who have gone ahead of us. They have died and now they are on the other side. These are our people. Your parents, my parents, your pastor, my pastor, the brother who led you to Jesus Christ, the brother who led me to the sanctified life of a spirit-filled existence. They're all there. They've gone ahead of us. How did they make it? How did they win over the demonic? How did they cross over victoriously? The book of Revelation says there are three things they did by which they overcame the enemy. The first thing they did was the blood of the Lamb. Victory is because of Calvary. Because Jesus conquered, you and I can conquer. It's not in our own strength that we bind the demonic. It's because of Jesus' victory, the blood of the Lamb. The blood is a reality. It is not an ideology or a theological concept. One day on Golgotha's mountain, the Son of God was crucified. He shed his blood. This is the blood that was shed for you. It is a remembrance that it really happened. To take a stand facing the demonic is to say, I stand under the cross because of the blood. I identify with him. The power of resurrection is because I accept the responsibility of bearing a cross, my cross. It is indispensable. The victory over demonic activities around us will indicate a personal cross that we need to bear. Let me use just one example in history. I don't know if you know the name Wilberforce, do you? Right, thank you, thank you. Wilberforce was a great, great man in history, especially in British history. He was a parliamentarian, brilliant, and he was tipped to become the next prime minister, literally. That's what all biographers speak about him. Wilberforce belonged to the small group of people who were known as the Clapham sect. They were truly born-again people who committed themselves to live a life of the, of the kingdom in the mainstream of the political world. It's not easy to do. And they ran smack into problems. One of the uh, wicked things that was happening at that time was slave traffic. Even Christians profited by enslaving other human beings and selling them or using them as slaves for their own enterprise. Wilberforce decided that it was time that somebody called this to be activity of the demonic. And he took a stand on this. And he fought and fought. Highly placed people, people who were after the profit that it brought them, all fought him. It was a nasty battle. It is told that almost on the deathbed, Wilberforce got the news that England had enacted the law that forbade slave holding or trafficking within the British Empire. Then it crossed over and it had its effect here on the North American continent later. But Wilberforce was one of those people who took a stand underneath the cross and bore his personal cross. It literally ruined his political career, aspirations. You ought to read about him sometime when you want to be inspired. To be engaged in the politics of our people and to say, I will not yield to things that are unjust would involve my personal cross. The Holy Spirit will sustain me but I'm the one who needs to bear the cross. And that will be taking my stand under the cross. The victory is because of his victory. 
the blood of Jesus Christ. The second thing that they did, the word of their testimony. They spoke. When somebody noticed it, they spoke very plainly. This is the reason. We were having a pastor's conference in Zaire, in Africa. In the team that I took to that conference, there were a number of African church leaders, very, very sizzling leaders. At lunchtime, they were telling stories about things that were happening in Africa. One of that story was about South Africa. At that time, Mr. D. Cluck was the Prime Minister of uh, South Africa. And they told me that he was interviewed by British BBC. And the, uh, the interviewer asked him, Mr. De Klerk, I hear you're a believing Christian. He smiled and said, I have never said that in any public matter, but I can tell you this. But for the blood of Jesus Christ, South Africa would have become rivers of human blood. That was an amazing testimony. He was saying it was not my smartness or Mr. Mandela's great appeal or the chief, Chief Butalesi, who was the chief of the Zulu people. Our, our people could have gone to four, three different directions and just torn each other up. But it was the blood of Jesus Christ that prevented such a happening. And South Africa is a nation now. Word of testimony. When the occasion calls, we need to bear witness to say the enemy is a defeated enemy because of the blood. It's not how smart I am or how carefully I played my politics, but it's because of my faith in him that redeemed the situation. The third thing they did, according to this verse, they did not love their lives to the death. What does that mean? When I face the demonic, the ultimate point to which he would push me to the wall is to say, if you continue this way, you are finished, you are done, you will die. Story, Stanley Jones, young missionary, going to India. He had to change ships in London, because that's how it was at the time of British Raj. And when we changed the ship, in the ship that was going to Bombay, now called Mumbai, there were many British officers, army officers, and there was a chaplain. And among them, he was a very young missionary, first time to India. And they were serving whiskey. An army chaplain took this young missionary under his tutelage to help him to know the ropes so that he can survive in India. And Jones looked at the whiskey and said, no, I don't. I don't drink. Then the chaplain asked him, you don't drink whiskey? Whiskey, He said, no, I don't. Then the chaplain said, but you can't live in India without whiskey. Implication. India is such a wretched place. You've got to drown your sensitivity with alcohol before you can survive. Learn, man. Learn before you get there. Jones says that he told his very senior, experienced chaplain, then let me die. I have an option. If drinking whiskey is the only way to survive, I can die. Now, whiskey is not the target of this story. The target of this story is there are moments when you have to say survival is not the purpose for existence. Because my existence is not limited to this life alone. I have life after death. You can't threaten me with death. Now the sequel to that story is, Jones did not die until he was 89. Nobody heard about the British Army chaplain after that story. Now, I'm not promising that you will live 89. But I'm saying, 
ultimately the question will be survival is the issue you want to live then go my way if you go against my way I will destroy you and then to say you can't touch me I belong to him that is the ceiling of the victory over the demonic and the death now how did Jesus do this did he face the demonic personally three occasions he did let me take you first to the first occasion in Luke chapter 5 pardon me 4 Luke chapter 4 you read the account that after baptism he was taken by the spirit into the wilderness I'm in chapter 4 are you yes yes the, the enemy came to tempt him according to the scripture three different times the first time he came to him he told him since you are the son of God why don't you make the stone bread you are hungry it'll help you and if the world knows that you can make stones bread you don't have to go to the cross to win them. You got them. Feed them. They'll be yours. Especially free. Give them free kana. You can't stop them. They'll all come follow you. So why do you want to go to the cross? Your identity is not the issue. Your father has testified. After you came out of baptism, this is my beloved son. No problem. Because you're the beloved son, why don't you do this? What is the first temptation? The first temptation is about the appetite. All of us have appetites. And some of the greatest motivations in life is to keep the appetite well fed, isn't it? In, in North America, probably the, 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 the phrase would be to bring the bacon home so that you'll have enough to eat that's fundamental and the enemy would twist us around his finger saying if you don't do some of these things I'm asking you to do your next paycheck may not be here the appetite appetite is not merely food clothing and the need for a roof it is also sexual appetite a drive that can destroy families and commitments and destroy it very quickly because you you seem to think you got economic clout to do it and get away with it what was the answer that the son of God gave to tie the bind the enemy he said to him man does not live by appetite alone he lives by the word that comes from God Man is not mono-channel, he's got dual channels. And if there must be presence in the music that comes out of your life, both channels need to play. Not just your physical appetite, but the spiritual word that comes from God that feeds you and makes you robustly human. He bound the enemy. We need to do the same thing. The second time the enemy came to him, according to Luke chapter 4, he took him to a, a high place, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I don't know where this high place is, but obviously it was a panoramic view. I'm sure he showed him um, Colombo, New Delhi, Washington, Ottawa, and he said, all of this belongs to me, the cheek of the devil, saying that I control all of this. They think they control, but I really control them. You want access to all this wealth? Fall at my feet. Wealth is very limiting here. He seems to say, I will give them to you. Your aim is to win them through the cross, don't have to go that far. I've already got them in my pocket. You bend your knee to me, they are yours. 
What is the second thing? Avarice. Greed. Is there an end to greed? I don't know how much of relevance this will have, but um, if this is south of the border in, in, in United States, people who have come to work in USA have had to wait to get a visa, a permit to come. Am I not right? I don't know how this will apply to the Canadian situation, so I'm not saying that this is true of you, but I'm talking about. And before the visa could be granted, how much of praying we make, isn't it? We give so much of promises. If only you give me this, all my life, life's talk and battle, past, before everything else, it will be all yours. Then we come here. And we thank God for it. First month, second month, third month, slowly, but very surely, it begins to slip away. Until finally we say, all of this is my doing. It's my smartness that brought me here. What has God got to do with this? I go to church. What's more? Avarice, it has a way of not only tightening its grip around us, it has a way of getting around our process of rational itself. Little wants more. An inch becomes a yard, and a yard becomes the whole nine yards. And how does Jesus stop this? He turns around and tells the devil, get behind me. You seem to think you can take over. I bend my knee to no other source than my Father. If I bend my knee to the only source, then I have the authority to tell the other source behind me. You have no authority over me because there is a living authority over me. First, appetite. Second, avarice. The third time he comes to him, he takes him to the pinnacle in the temple and says, jump. Ambition. He says, if you jump, all these thousands of people gathered in the courtyard will see angels sweeping you. And from there on, there is no need for the cross. The spectacular affirmation would make them want to bow down to you. You got them. What is being done here? The devil seems to make the ambition God. There's nothing wrong with ambition. All over the Bible, ambitious people change history. Without ambition, you and I are zombies. But when ambition becomes God, and God becomes a means to achieve your ambition, we are in trouble. What does the Son of God say to bind the demonic at this point? He says, you will not test the Lord your God. God is not to be tested. God is to be trusted. When I pray, am I trying to change God's hands to suit me? When I pray, I am in faith affirming that God always does the right thing. Don't test the Lord your God. The three things, appetite, avarice, and ambition. These are three areas in which the demonic can bind us if we don't. Through the authority and the technique that Jesus used, the methodology, bind him. The second time the devil came to him was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Two times Jesus prayed. The first time he prayed, he said to, to the Father, Father, let this cup pass away. I have the reference. I'll give it to you. If you want, you go home and check it out. Luke chapter 22, 
41 and 42. That's the first time. The second time he went in to pray, Matthew 26, 42. The first time he said, <coughs> let this cup pass. If it's your will, please let it pass. The second time he went in, he said, Father, this is your hand that is giving me the cup. Why should I say no to it? I take it. I don't know if you remember the hymn we all learned in daily vacation Bible school. So high, you can't get over it so deep. You can't get under it so wide. You can't get around it. What is it? Huh? Love of God, isn't it? Right. Sometimes there are life's experiences that are like that. You can't get around it. You can't get over it. You can't tunnel underneath it. You've got to go through it. Gethsemane was like that. My wife and I have seven grandchildren. One of them is in heaven. When he was eight years old, he, he was always, um, our house is closer to the primary school than his parents' house. So he'll come home first here, eat whatever breakfast Adela had cooked that day, you know, upuma or uh, uh, puttu. If you don't know what upuma is, ask somebody who knows. Uh, these are all Indian breakfast stuff, particularly Tamil breakfast stuff. And then he will uh, do his homework and then will come and pull me from my computer, wanting me to play with him. We will, I'll have to become a dinosaur and roll in the grass with him. He loved his grandma. He called her Appamma, uh, Amamma, mother's mother. And it was time for us to go to India for pastor's conference. That day he sat on my foot, holding on to my calf, and I carried him like that from room to room. He looked up at me laughingly. He said, Tata, you go. Why do you want to take Amamma with you? Leave her here. And I told him that, uh, you know, it doesn't work like that. So we left. When we arrived in Mizoram, in Aijol, my daughter, his mother, had called saying that they found a growth in the base of his brain and they have to have surgery done. It seemed like a difficult spot to reach. We finished the conference as quickly as we could. The airline gave us seats. So we came back. All the while I called him and talked to him. He was already in the hospital. And he would tell me, Tata, they found something inside my brain, but the doctors are going to take it out. And we returned. We prayed much for Jonathan. The news got into the internet by somebody else. And so people around the world were praying. But in three months, Jonathan went to be with the Lord. So high, you can't get over it so deep. You can't get under it so wide. You can't get around it. You've got to go through. There is a Gethsemane in your life and my life. What do we do with the demonic? Do we come out and complain, sit in the corner and say, Why did you let this happen to me, God? Couldn't you make this cup pass over? You know the power he had afterwards? If you would check when you go home, John 18, verse 11. John 18, verse 11. You remember Simon cuts the ear of one of the soldiers who came to take him? He says to him, put the sword in the sheath. What does he say to him afterwards? Will I not drink of the cup that my father has given me? And how does that reflect in history? He heals the ear. That's a story that will stun anybody. He who had the power to stop the ocean and cast out demons and raise people from the dead wouldn't use that power for himself. Why? 
because he bound the demonic who wanted to cause that revolt that would have robbed him of the power to bind him, robbed the Son of God of the power to bind the demonic. There is a Gethsemane where you face him face to face. The last time he faced the demonic was on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. A Scottish Presbyterian minister describes the scene in poetry. He says, when the Son of God hung on the cross, in the closing moments, all the demonic forces danced around the foot of the cross. Now, this is poetry. This is not scripture. Danced at the foot of the cross, and the de demonic taunted him, saying, you came to show the love that man will never generate by himself, the agape love, the love that knows no aggression, the love that never keeps account. Man does not know this love. You came to be that love to man. Look what they have done to you. They have rejected you. They have said in drama and in reality, we don't want you. You're finished. Redemption is over. And so they were dancing, according to this Scottish minister. Then he says in his poetry, the Son of God looked down and asked the demonic, is this the worst you can do? And the demon said, yes. I have bound the best you can give, and this is the worst I can do. And then the Son of God said, If this is the worst, I have got you. You haven't got me. Because if I can forgive the worst that you can do, I have more power than you can ever claim. And I bind you. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. If he did not pray that prayer that day on Golgotha, but if he had said, Father, do justice because your nature is justice, the whole little planet would have gone to smithereens and the period of grace would have never started at all. On the cross, he proved that forgiveness has the power to bind all the consolidated forces of evil. In our homes, in our families, do we know this power? In our relationship between the spouses, do we let a long list of things that we remember against each other hinder our prayer? For if two will agree together, touching anything, he says, I will give it to you. He says, if two of you agree together, I am there among you, very really present. You can bind what must be bound, and it will be bound. You can loose what must be loosed in society. It will be loosened. What is the requirement? The requirement is the dynamism of constant forgiveness in relationship. Where do I learn this? From the cross. Simon, son of Yona, do you love me more than your failure? In love, will you yield to my love so that I can invade you? On the day of Pentecost, after Peter's consent, the Holy Spirit personalized this invasive love in Simon's life can happen to you and to me also. Bind the demonic. Don't let him bind you. Missions is the exercising of the authority of Calvary to bind the demonic. Take a stand under the cross. Bind him. And the Lord bless you. I'd like to pray with you before I go down and sit down. Would you like to pray? Close your eyes. Bow your heads.
I hope in some way God spoke to you this morning. And if he did, I wish you were ready to say, I can't say no to him. I bind the power of the demonic. My appetite gaining control over me. My greed, avarice, making me a slave to the demonic. My ambition running away with me that God himself is only a tool for my ultimate achievement. My prayer has lost its direction. I want to bind the demonic. I've been complaining because I have said, God, God didn't do just with me. Why did this happen to me? Why couldn't he prevent it? And I've been sitting on the side of the road instead of walking in obedience with him. The Lord spoke to me today. And I want to bind the demonic. I give consent to the will of the Lord. And would like to heal the ones that caused me the deep pain and damage. The power of the living God. Forgiveness. It's difficult in our interpersonal relationship at home. We become soured up and bitter, blaming each other. And the sweetness of the peace of God is only a memory. I want to say to Jesus, like Simon did, I love you. I love you more than this disaster that is my home. Please, Lord, put me back together. I will obey you in love. I will measure the depth of my love in obedience to you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Father in heaven, release us from this constant game of blaming that we together will become warriors in prayer. Release us. If you would say any one of these and would like to do it meaningfully, I'd like to pray with you. Wherever you're seated, if you say, God did speak to me, and I'm speaking with responsive yes to him, do pray for me. Would you quietly stand and remain standing where you are seated, I'd like to pray with you. God bless you. Bless you. God bless you. If your spouse is st standing, yes, it is right for you to stand along with her or him. Because this is the moment for which you are one. God bless you. Are there others? Father in heaven, to many of us, your word has become personal and real. You tapped us on our shoulder. Not because we are great people. Not because we are loaded with skills. But we are your people. For whom you shed your blood. We stand amazed in your presence. Jesus of Nazareth. Take over. We 
We'd like to follow your steps to bind the strong one who controls the mind of millions of people around us and our mind, my mind, slowly, inch by inch, the sensitivity becomes calloused and indifference, lethargy, and laziness have taken its place. The call of the kingdom is for the ardent ones, not for the lazy ones. Lord, help me. Come. Come into our family and our home through the power of continuing exercise of mutual forgiveness. May we celebrate your presence, Lord Jesus. And in your authority, may we bind the strong one in the society within which we live, at home, at office, in the worshipping community, and in the society. Come, Lord Jesus. Release the bondage. We give consent to you and we pray this prayer in the name of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. Please start reading the word together to expose yourself together to the truth of the word is necessary to call you down from absolutizing yourself over against each other. No submission to the one authority which is the word of God. Pray together. Embrace the world in your time of prayer and then help each other mutually to obey the Holy Spirit. Don't criticize and bring the other down help be a mentor and help the other to stand correction is necessary but that can be done very creatively do it in the name of jesus through the power of the holy spirit and god make you a power to transform the society god bless you